right, so since we're a small group, we can go ahead and get started. Good morning. Welcome to today's active teaching lab on intra-departmental uh, collaboration. Um, I think we have a few returning participants. Mario, welcome back. Jim, welcome back. Lauren as well. Henry, is this your first active teaching lab? Yes. Welcome. So I just want to orient you to some of the resources that we have. So in front of you, this is the paper copy of the activity sheet. On this activity sheet, you have a lot of different tools, tips, and links. Um, however, on the paper copy, the links don't work, right? So at the top of the sheet, there is a URL for you to enroll in the Canvas course that we have for the Active Teaching Lab, where you can access the digital version of this so that all of the resources will be available to you through a URL and a link. And if you have any questions, you know, please don't. Uh, please don't hesitate. Um, so today's lab is what I think is potentially on a very divisive topic, um, intra-departmental collaboration, because it depends on your own department. Um, so since we're a small group, I do want to ask everyone to introduce themselves. Um, what, who are you? What would you like to know more about? And in your own department, what does collaboration mean? What does it look like um, as a graduate student and as a PA in do it? Um, I'm sort of torn between different departments. And collaboration is very different. One's more antiquated than the other in some instances. Um, anyway, Lauren, can we start with you, please? <clears throat> so um, I'm Lauren. I uh, direct the, the Collaborative Language Program, um, which sort of in and of itself is interdepartmental, but across uh, UW system schools. So I'm kind of like the head of a language department, but all of my people are on different campuses. That makes sense. Um, so I'm curious more than anything to find out about what everybody else's experience is in a more internal way and see how that, because some of the things I guess that I get challenged by is that the people in my department have their local rules and situations and then they have mine on top of it and trying to work well with all of that. So. Um, yeah, I'm Jim Burling, I'm an instructional designer for DOIT Academic Technology. Um, so while there is collaboration obviously within DOIT and AT, um, collaboration for me usually looks like working with a faculty or a program. Um, and that's often kind of an interesting dynamic because frequently the schools that I will work with also have their own instructional design staff. So some of what I'm doing in collaboration is also with other support folks. Um, so it really varies depending on the, the kind of project I'm doing, what, what you know, those stakeholders are. Um, all the time. So within a department, how does that instructional designer collaborate with faculty? So that's often in a much more like get my course on its feet kind of thing or okay. technical troubleshooting, uh -huh. whereas we tend to be in a kind of design and development stage. Um, and so it's often a, where I'm creating something but then handing it off either directly to an instructor or sometimes to an instructional designer who is a support role. So building things that other people you know, can use and not pay for in that process. So, yes. Mario. I'm Mario. I'm the, the biochemistry department. And so uh, actually every course that I teach is co-taught. So it's, it's, okay. it's collaborative. So there's uh, at least one other instructor. And, Uh, just seeing how that works. For me, it's pretty good. There's been really no problem, but there are things like in one course, it's a large course. And, uh, we've got an online version. There's some things I'd like to try and how to approach it to my colleagues because they, they have, they're in senior position, right? They're so focused in this research, so they probably want minimal changes that they have to do. So, and what you say there's sometimes big things that you would like to try or do. And when you say co-teaching, is it two people present in the same room at the same time, or is it one uh, person teaches one week, another person teaches another? Or, so okay. in one course, it's, it's like, it's like what you said, it's one of us in the first the unit, the other people are not in the classroom. Mm -hmm. But in the other courses, we're usually there together. But usually one person is leading and they'll switch. Yeah. Okay. Cliff. Cliff. Oh, thanks. Cliff Cunningham, I work with the Learning UW team here. And, uh, mostly a support capacity to try to figure out what you guys do. Uh, I support some of the products that we talk about here. I don't do in-class teaching myself, so I 
honor those of you who fight the real fight and we we give you the honor. That sounds much more combative than it really needs to be. That's how they do. Awesome. Henry. And uh I know they threw out the department of statistics and I got to work this year. Okay. And I have been working I have past experiences being a innovation technology office mm -hmm. where I had to do so many collaborations okay. with my colleagues to mm -hmm. try to enroll them into this kind of activities, especially in tools for big learning tools. Okay. Yeah. And now I am the witch term here in the, for the department is participating with uh, two courses. Please. <laughs> 324 and 371, 324 is for statistical engineering, uh -huh. and 371 is statistical by time. Okay. Then we are working on that courses mm -hmm. to design a material a activity to make active learning in lectures. Oh. Lectures. Then one group in engineering is the, the professor there, the social not all students, mm -hmm. is this student, but in the other, uh, we have uh, lectures, mm -hmm. then we are trying to get everybody in the same board uh, according to new materials and uh, how to work together to improve our teaching experience. Uh -huh. And so within one of those courses that is being redesigned, are multiple faculty members working together to create materials, or is there one person who is in charge of that entire course for now until forever? Okay, as I, I, I know, uh, one, five years ago, one lecturer was in charge of this activity to do some material. Okay. And he wrote some document. Mm -hmm. And now, first, another uh, colleague took this material and trying to redesign uh -huh. the whole material, but he haven't been. Uh, collaboration between all. Mm -hmm. This is the idea now. Then I record to be here mm -hmm. because uh, the department want everybody to work. Yeah, make collaboration in order to so many advantages. And we know mm -hmm. with this experience that this is the goal. And uh, at the same time, offer uh, an excellent courses for another yeah, department because you, you you don't have to offer the same. Course, but different professor, they deliver different materials, different assignments. Mm -hmm. like for now, we have assignments and discussion. Okay. Uh, and that, that is the common thing. Okay. But the common thing that we want is a document or a book or notebook for the student. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Have, they don't have books, they need material, they need canvas, or mm -hmm. that should be okay. the idea. Awesome. So in the few things that I want to show you today, um, these are just ideas that came to my mind. Uh, if you have questions, recommendations, um, resources of your own that you would like to present, please don't hesitate. Um, obviously, one, the first one is Blackboard Collaborate Culture, which is very similar to Skype. It's all inside of Canvas. Um, and Lauren, I think, for instance, the people who are across the state uh, signing in with a guest link is possible to Blackboard Collaborate. So you can maybe, I'm not sure if you're in Canvas in every single <coughs> system-wide instance, but at least for you, you would be able to bring in um, different people. Um, one other feature of Canvas that I do want to demo with you today is Canvas Commons. Um, it's something that came up last semester that I thought was pretty um, rich and useful for intra-departmental collaboration, even for your instance of just sharing learning objects between instructional designers. Pressbooks is another one that we've talked about um, at length in the active teaching labs. And a final one that I really, really enjoyed, it was a very formative experience for me in my own graduate work, was lesson study. Uh, which could be interesting for you, Mario, to sort of get into that faculty buy-in and encouraging them to just sort of get their feet wet um, in terms of buying into more innovative and enhanced uh, types of um, learning options. Um, so on campus already, um, I think this information is sort of already um, known. There are quite a few different cloud-based collaborations, so getting sort of, Henry, for you, getting people just together and working in the same space um, is particularly complicated in a department such as large as the Department of Statistics. Um, Google Drive and Google Suite are features that we have on campus. 
Um, but for anyone, Lauren, do you use Google Drive, Google Suite? I, so here's here's one of the things that happens. So yes, I do. Mm -hmm. I use it a ton yeah. for lots of stuff, yeah. and so do some of my instructors, but some of the campuses don't allow you to use Google, and they have you locked oh. out of it. So the only way you can use it would be if you had a private account. You know, back not that long ago, our email was Google, uh -huh. and then they switched to OneDrive, uh -huh. right? So any of those people that are at this one campus, which will I won't name, um, <clears throat> no longer have access to any of their stuff that they had from when they were using their campus mm -hmm. email as their Google login. Um, so, on the actual digital copy of the act of the activity sheet on the back page, um, and here we for you on the on the paper copy. Um, I start. I wanted to start a list of sort of the, the pros and cons of the advantages and disadvantages of using Google Drive versus using Box, just sort of as a resource to figure out why would you use Google in the first place, um, why wouldn't you use it. So in this case, I'm not everyone having access to Google. For me, in my own instance of Google Drive, even though it is very vibrant and collaborative and it's clean, it doesn't allow. It, it's not easy to use Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, PowerPoint. Everyone has to use the Google feature. Um, I just don't think Google Docs is very sufficient, especially from a foreign language department, because at least on a Mac, you cannot hold down the key to allow an accent. You have to go in and add the accent for a foreign language. So for my background, for me, that has been a workaround that I've um, found uh, incredibly challenging. Um, but Google is sort of all over um, campus now. I'm not sure if you're um, aware uh, you are using Whisk List that will be migrated to Google Groups starting in September. So if you have a large departmental mailing list, for example, um, majors in the Department of Statistics. Uh, Mario, which department are you in? Bio Biochemistry. Biochemistry. So I imagine you have a large list of majors, minors, or certificate students perhaps are in different tracks, graduate students. All that will be migrated to Google Groups um, starting in September. So it's something to keep in mind um, and on your radar. Um, any box users? Box, good, bad, ugly? It may be going away. Yeah, so recently in the past, ugly and, bad. and so I think it was, <laughs> it was in the past week, this is just a, a screenshot from a website that came through the Box users list group saying that Box is changing their service agreement with the university and might change the pricing structure, which could affect on the, the amazing unlimited storage options that we have on campus. Um, I'm not an advocate for the university or Box, but I would strongly encourage you uh, to reply to that survey request and say these are all the reasons why in Box and the number of people that are using Box within my department that would be affected by a decrease in service. Um, just for me as a graduate student, as a researcher, all of my material is in Box, so losing that access uh, would be somewhat devastating for me because I use Microsoft Word um, within that. Um, I've never used OneDrive. Um, I, I, just, I figured there are far too many <laughs> options already available on campus? Jen, uh, are you? I, I just shared the sentiment of I'm not a big fan of it. <laughs> Why not? It kind of traps you into lock in. I mean, it's a similar problem, I think, to some of the Google stuff. Mm -hmm. You're not also getting really great collaboration tools. So yeah, I don't really see the advantage of the box. And the only tools are Microsoft features, right? right. So, <clears throat> so it's similar to Google Drive. But. Your ability to collaborate with people, as you mentioned, is strained. The ability even just to get into it is much more complicated, I think, than getting into Google. Um, and I can't run it unless I'm way? wrong. I can't run it straight from my, like I yeah. can download Google Drive and just be on my computer. I can't do that with the OneDrive. Yeah. I can download a file, but I don't have like a OneDrive application. Yeah. There's still kind of a bifurcation in the collaboration stuff from there, so where you can use a Microsoft Office version of your document if you've done things through OneDrive. You can also do that in Box too though. So. In your examples of working with different departments but also being external, yeah. how are you engaging with Yeah, I mean, we try to meet them where they are for the most part. So if someone really wants to use OneDrive, I'm going to do it. Um, but typically we use Box and G Suite. So okay. that tends to be where and the G Suite for collaborative documents and Box for complex file storage. <laughs> Uh, but I also think that you can integrate Google Docs in or Google Files into Box, if I'm not mistaken. You can link to them, so ah, that, okay, that's so where it works. I mean, okay. and it's still, so yeah, that's often what we do. Um, it's just a little bit annoying. So it mm -hmm. sort of leads to, why are we doing two things right. instead of one thing? But um, our preference for Box was until recently. 
recently at least, you could work with things just on a mobile computer in mm -hmm. a way, especially with complex project files where there are a lot of files talking to each other. Google could break those and Fox would not. Yeah. I think it's gotten a lot better um, using the Google Drive application that you were describing. Mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's sort of a, a weird bit. I'm, I'm still very much in box for my own work. So yeah. For people that, in your instance, for people who are not allowed to use Google, I guess in their state account, is box the only option then to get around? No, OneDrive. OneDrive, <coughs> entirely. Okay. And I haven't found it yet, but I've been told that OneDrive does have um, some forms creation capability like Google Forms. I have not found it. Um, but that's something I use a ton, so mm -hmm. a lot of what I do ha with my Google stuff has been um, allow anybody with the link to access it, kind mm -hmm. of sharing um, for the people who can't get <coughs> to Google. Yeah. Um, and then also a lot of those people are now have their own Google login and they're just doing that on their private yeah. email and they don't care. And, just to make it easy for everybody to be able to collaborate. Because one thing that we do we, here in the, at least for the, the documents that are in the teaching lab, um, in the sharing settings, and I'm sure this is you know, information that may not be familiar to everyone, um, opening up sharing settings to allow anyone to access it might get around this concern for people so, so that you're not working in five different spaces right. um, and just creating that external access so that, in Mario, I'm thinking of you in questions of faculty buy and this is something that I've confronted. You've created a Google Doc, and it's something that you're familiar with, but you're sending it to someone who has no clue what this is, and the fact that their UW system ID requires them to log in, et cetera. Right. And so one thing for me that's been incredibly useful is just making this as <coughs> open as possible to avoid that confusion in hopes that they can see the light, that you know, uh, an easier, I guess, access is, is possible. And the way that OneDrive works, too, is they, it's easier to collaborate if you're on the same .edu, but when you're dealing with multiple .edu's, then it's, they don't, the sharing capability is messed up. <laughs> so, Um, they, you you have no choice, I think, but to give them the if you have this link, you can log in and edit. Okay. Um, you can't add somebody from a different campus in a private okay. way. Yeah. So anything sensitive, you're really mm -hmm. stuck. Henry, right. you had a question? Yes, uh, I don't know how. I, I was asking somebody here about another tool that in science, especially in science engineering. Mm -hmm. We used to use is a uh, base cloud, uh, for example, Overbit. Overbit is a base cloud for late, like latest. Okay. And I'm not familiar at all. So yeah, okay. the latest is really easy to write down formulas. Mm -hmm. Then in science and engineering, always uh, we have to write uh, documents that require so much formulas, graphs, as the mm -hmm. type type of graph, diagrams. And I, I don't know if the, the, the office is considering that kind of collaboration for latest. If the AI can do that, if you uh, add some uh, apps, then that's the reason that I, I often use Google Drive. Mm -hmm. oh, but, but they prefer to use Overly because in Overly, I can uh, write down my document at the same time, stay with the student. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can correct immediately by using formulas. Mm -hmm. the, the other, the other, this is for uh, editing aspect. The other is for computing aspect. Mm -hmm. Now there is R Studio Cloud. R Studio Cloud allows you to make computing, uh, programming, a many things. Uh, it's web, it's web based. Yeah, mm -hmm. based cloud. That is really so useful for now. It's free. Uh, and I am using it, yeah. You can collaborate with another people. Mm -hmm. Like another tool is GitHub is free, yeah, but, uh, but we can connect with GitHub from Google uh, R Studio that is basically programming with R. Mm -hmm. I don't know 
Python, for example, is another sure. tool that I'm engineering on time. This is kind of a tool that has been, uh, I don't know where can I, if the university has this kind of tool, this collaboration mm -hmm. also. Would you mind, on the on the digital copy of the activity sheet, would you mind sharing those links and resources just so that anyone who wants okay. further information about these specific sort of science collaboration platforms? Okay. Was that, may I clarify, uh, you mentioned the name of an application there uh, for creating the formulas. Could you tell me again the name of that? Was that over? Uh, it's a base cloud. The base cloud latest. 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 Okay. That's LaTeX. That's LaTeX. That's LaTeX. That's the language. Gotcha. But there is some other uh, 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 overly use latest and put everything cloud based. Gotcha. And yeah, that's it. The university also has some license with uh, Git Labs, too. Um, so if you are doing anything that really requires a Git style um, yeah. project tracking, so that's something that is available um, mm -hmm. at that level. So Git Lab? Git Lab. Uh, um, yeah, so thank you, because it's really useful now. We have, they have a, a web site. We can open a, a free web, web site, mm -hmm. okay. web page, using Git Lab. And this is really useful for us because I have all my documents uh, in, in GitHub, but I am working in my studio doing something, but yeah. all my documents are in GitHub. And I can just now arm up down, block, block, boot down, boot down is a, it's basic in arm up down. Arm up down is useful for uh, use shiny, it's a iterative application that in chemistry or many things. And, and you just put down, you can publish your book mm -hmm. online, mm -hmm. and you can update at the same time in class. You have a mistake, you realize about a mistake, you update immediately. Yeah. Yeah. And put down is so nice to do, but I need our markdown, mm -hmm. our base cloud, something like that. Okay. And we have at the same time. Yeah. To publish book, you know, because you have book press, I think so. Yeah, press book, and that's an example I'll show in a minute. Somebody told me it has limitation with the latest mm -hmm. and, and R, because when we are writing in the statistics, some uh, document, we need to write down the code, and at the same time, the, the, the chart is ready. And we do PDF, uh, Word document, and uh, HTML document at the same time. So you don't need to make a graph, than before copying and inserting a mm -hmm. word document. Sure. No, just at the same time, you can add everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you know about that? A little bit. I'm thinking about Presto specifically, which I think is using MathTex instead of. So it's a. MathTex is. Yeah. Uh, that is also. Oh, it, it'll do both? Oh, okay. because MathTex is literally uh, lighter. Yeah. And LightTex is a little heavier. Sure. Especially when you are writing HTML documents. Right. Okay. So I, that, that's good to know at least that they can do both. That that's, both. Some, that's somewhat helpful for breaking it. And then being able to bring stuff in that you've written in Markdown. Um, yeah, I mean, at least there you can kind of pull that into HTML and put it into press books. But yeah. yeah. Would you mind writing that, what you just said, yes. on the bottom of the activity sheet? Yeah, right. As, yeah. That's far above my. Level of uh, <laughs> understanding what you just said. Yeah, Markdown for Python and other languages. Mm -hmm. And have you using for engineering and science? Yeah, that is my biggest complaint with Google. Um, it's cheeks and things too. I write everything in Markdown. Markdown, yeah. yeah. Uh, I like that so yeah. much. Markdown. Yeah. Really nice. So Markdown is a, is a markup language yeah. for clearly um, doing formatting and things that's a little bit more mm -hmm. easy to read. Visually, then HTML, sure, but, um, and then be exported to other formats. And, you know, so and sort of my own confusion and I guess unfamiliarity with this topic, I think, sort of raises the question of actually faculty buy-in. And when you have these sort of complex tools in your examples, how do you present that as the process for collaboration? And I guess Mara sort of raises um, your question about how do you pitch options. And I think it comes to that. I mean, to me, it's just sort of very overwhelming to hear. You know, six or seven different possibilities for includes, including equations and whatnot. But what does that conversation look like in your departments and your experiences for? Here's the process. You know, we've identified a need. Here's the process. We 
used to it. And this is a safe space. <laughs> For example, the web course, the, the large, large Google web course, and there's four of us, me and three other instructors. So we get together once a semester. I guess we could get together more than once a semester, but at least once a semester. And then if there's anything that we want to talk about, uh, we, you know, I bring it to their attention mm -hmm. and see what they, they think that they can really do. And then, of course, I could contact them like, you know, during the semester or whatever if I wanted, but mm -hmm. that's usually that's how we do it too pretty much I see something cool I share it with everybody else and say hey if you want to use this I'm happy to help support you in using it yeah. um, this is what I'm doing with it or whatever and it's not really a group conversation and yeah. those are usually things that are on top of whatever UW is allowing or supporting or whatever yeah. um, and that's where John usually always steps in and says and that's not supported by UW, just so you all know. Yeah. <laughs> Jim, in your examples and clip two as well, uh, what does it look like when you're approaching this to faculty members who are not really involved in the design process? They themselves yeah. have to learn what you are creating, yeah. and it's maybe you know the, the the learning curve is very high. The time investment for them. Mm -hmm. It's high. What, what strategy, if that's your question, what strategies do you Yeah, have? well, on the design end, we do course mapping a lot. We're on mm -hmm. top of a collaborative Google document or a spreadsheet or something where we sort of map here our learning objectives, here are the things that we're going in. So that's a living document that is kind of updated with the students, so things we want students to get out of the course. In the development end, we just do collaborative box folders. So um, I'm supporting an engineering course that's being taught right now, and they we develop some templates for slides and things that like here are the basic sort of standardized yeah so it's like here's a real world example it might look like this um, mm -hmm. and then they share and cooperate in the building of assessment things within there so there's sort of a one central location for keeping track of that stuff and then I put it into Canvas sure so that's does it does it seem like that slow process of standardization even within one course is sort of bleeding out into other courses so that it becomes a I don't want to say a departmental brand or experience, but sort of students so. realize this is a whatever course it may be. Yeah, I mean, there are, well, and certainly this is a reach course too. So there are a lot of what we're capturing is indicating to students like this is an active learning activity. Got so it. part of that is, I think, kind of feeds out. But each department is unique, so right. they have their own kind of uh, mores that they like to follow. I have a question for you. So in Bach, I know you can store any kind of file. I've mostly used it for sharing images with yeah. the media center that's going to make my brochure or something. Um, <clears throat> so it sounds like you're also storing slides that could have been made in PowerPoint or Keynote or something like that. Yep. What is the reason for um, storing all those different file types there as opposed to sharing them with the internal um, sharing ability of something like if you're doing it PowerPoint why wouldn't you just share that template directly from OneDrive PowerPoint over put it moving sure. it to box to sharing yeah I mean you could probably if you're working exclusively in, in Microsoft products I think OneDrive would be fine um, it's we just like the flexibility that we often end up with our own development files in there, which are not necessarily like and application specific. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So uh -huh. that's sort of okay. more of an open palette for all of that stuff. Okay. And that's we tend to follow, even if we're doing a lot of the initial development, as I, I think I mentioned earlier, we do some handing off. And we also always try and teach instructors. They may not be masters of web development, but they should at least have some agency and understanding. So those things should be accessible to them or anyone. So, okay. you know, HTML templates for Canvas and things can go in ah. alongside it. Right. Um, okay. I, you could do that in OneDrive. So it's more just that we're using Box for those things already. Um, but Box does have a, a kind of nice neutral claim. Mm -hmm. So that, that's anecdotal to me. Okay. Yeah. Is Box capable of housing any file type? Or is there any, there's no restriction on? Seems like it. Yes. Yeah. 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 There's, no, there's nothing that's going to say, nope, don't put this here. Um, yeah. There are things that it can preview for.
for you with a web browser and things that people have. So it may say, like, hey, I don't know what this is, but you can always download it. Work with it. Good luck, yeah. Right, exactly. But, um, but yeah, we use it for everything. So. Mm -hmm. awesome. so speaking of sharing and group Canvas, um, has, or is everyone familiar with Canvas Commons? I've heard of it, but I've never used it. Awesome. Great. So Canvas Commons, if you're looking at your Canvas, actual Canvas site, uh, your home page um, for Canvas, on the bottom right over here, or bottom left, I guess, um, you have that little C Canvas Commons. So if you click on that, um, what it is is sort of an internal box to Canvas where instructors, universities, but mainly, at least in terms of Canvas Commons currently, a lot of the information and a lot of the learning objects that are shared are from the K-12 environment. So we have a lot of high schools, middle schools, elementary schools um, that are sharing. At the top of the Canvas Commons, for example, if you typed in Active Teaching Lab, you would see that uh, last semester we shared all of the course content um, from our Canvas page um, for the active teaching lab and into, into the world. Um, to anyone who has access to Canvas can access this course content. Um, so it could be a way that you could, um, for example, import very similarly to you um, if you were migrating from one Canvas course to another, you could import all of the content or you could select content that you wanted to import and download if you found a quiz or a template that was pretty um, pretty, yeah, I guess, um, and go from there. Um, the reason why I wanted to show Canvas Commons um, to you was more actually for internal purposes um, within a department. Um, so this is just my own personal um, sandbox, for example, and imagine that I'm teaching a course and so Mario, the example that you gave, a meeting up once a month and you have this discussion, maybe it's an online discussion or it's a quiz or a certain assignment that worked really well. The discussion itself was just an absolute gem. One thing you can do is to sort of save that discussion as an individual object and move it sort of into the Canvas Commons privately. Is over here on the side of your option, on the side of your, um, I guess, learning object, share it to Commons. You see that? And so it opens up um, a lot of different options. You create a title or a title, obviously a naming convention. That would be relevant for you. What I'm interested in and sort of demonstrating here is you have a lot of different options about who can use this resource. So if you want to limit it only to yourself, and this is a personal file repository within Canvas, I really like this discussion, but I don't want anyone else to see it except me, obviously clicking only me. Um, all of the people who are involved at the University of Wisconsin-Madison could also be an option. Uh, which would open it up to all instructors across campus so they can see the glory of your discussion post. When you, um, when you collect select consortium, it's open to anyone, I think, in unison. Cliff, is that? That sounds right. I'm, I want to say is that is. the Big yeah. Ten, Nebraska, Nebraska, Michigan, Indiana, et cetera. So that which would make sense. So all of them, all of, they would all be able to see this glorious discussion post. Finally, public is something that we just saw with the possibility for the active teaching lab. The thing that I cannot show you currently, and I think um, in, more, in more terms of faculty development, is you can create a Canvas group within your department. Um, and these instructions are on your activity sheet. They are, they should be. They're on the shared content faculty, the Canvas University faculty, faculty, faculty commons, here at the media. Create a, can, a Canvas Google, a Canvas group. I think Cliff is actually the gatekeeper for group permissions for uh, Canvas or learning of the team. Uh, approves Canvas groups. Uh, the learning of the team does. Yeah. yeah. So you would create a Canvas group. You can identify faculty members that teach the same course, or, you know, English 101, all of you working together, and you could just share those individual resources or entire courses just within faculty. So you wouldn't have to share it to the entire campus, the entire universe, but sort of gives you that intermediate space between only me and the entire university, um, So, which could be um, useful. 
Obviously, there are some concerns about um, licensing and copywriting if you're sharing copyrighted material out into the wider world. Um, that is definitely something um, to consider. Version notes, um, obviously, in sort of more metadata, um, that is necessary um, for you. Um, and this is more of a yes, sir. So, for in your example, like you're in the discussion of the campus course, and yes. then you and then you've recorded it to the Commons. Uh -huh. Okay. So, can you do that like with a uh, discussion in Piazza, or is it specifically to campus? That is a great. Um, should be specifically to campus. Yeah, I'd be surprised if it was like yeah. the integration. So it's not going to bring it. It's not going to bring it to Piazza. Yeah. So. I want to. You want to test that theory? Uh, we have Piazza. Maybe. No. Yes, the button has to be there. I was waiting for it. Sorry. <laughs> so, I'm all where, sure. where did you get oh, the share to comments again? Okay, so, I see the import oh, from, but I don't sorry. see the share. Um, I'm going to go back to my own sandbox. So, for example, I'm in my discussion clicking the three little bits. Oh, the hamburger. Hamburger, the food item, whichever one it may be then share to comments. And then from there, you're able to select only me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So far, so good? Yeah, so you can't, you don't share the whole course. You're just you can sharing. choose to share the whole course, but okay. you've selected that one object. Okay. So you're sharing an individual object, but then later you could share your entire course if you want to. Yeah. So give you an example of it. pretty clever about if you share just one component and then later the rest of the course, does it duplicate things in that? Or it probably would, I would imagine. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's my suspicion. But one thing to keep in mind is that for any edit that you make after you share it, it does not update automatically. So the Canvas course that we've shared for the Active Teaching Lab into the Canvas Commons stop at the end of the fall. So the current module that we have for spring 2020 is not included in that. We would have to go back and share that again um, and work that way. So just going into the commons itself, you have obviously um, tons of different things. You can search by, you know, um, learning object type. Um, Canvas has created a color code that I don't know if it necessarily is the most um, effective, but sort of creating different types of activities. You could do French verbs, so my self-sustaining example, creating finding quizzes that correspond to the title of French verbs, um, grades, and you can see within the, I guess the tile, how many times it's been downloaded, and the stars, how many times it's been favorited. So maybe 52 downloads and only one person favorited it. Um, I don't know, you could draw um, your own conclusions uh, from that. Um, but what I really wanted to show for the, for the purposes of your own personal Canvas commons share area is you can, clicking on shared at the top, you can see everything that you've shared with yourself and with the Canvas group if you do create that. So you would see these individual objects that you have from different courses that you want to sort of um, archive and create for the future. Lauren, I want to. I'm wondering why you would share it with yourself. What Because you would already have access to it. The, the reason why I, uh, go ahead. At least very early on, there's no easy way to copy the quiz. Now there are a lot of criticisms. People have no idea. Okay, why can I, I can't do it right now. So, so copy paste my right, quiz. But when you import from a course, doesn't that do the same thing? Uh, well, if you go, yeah, if you take it, if you go through the export process and you export your quiz out and then come and copy it back in, yes, you may get a copy of the quiz. But this, I, mean, I was actually, I was going to test it right now to see how fast I can move to actually copy the quiz. Okay. Because my thinking on it, not having ever done this, I guess, because I haven't taught in a while, but to me it would seem a lot easier to share one thing that worked really well for yourself, rather than exporting an entire course, importing something from an entire course, selecting through it, trying to remember that. And then here, to me, it seems like if you dedicated this to yourself as things that worked really well, as sort of a, an easier file sharing system, mm -hmm. that you could then re-import to a different course easily. Yeah. yeah Versus create, that whole... Kind of create your own little... Yeah, of right. objects you created that are good and that are needed and you want to have as template objects that you deploy in future courses. So okay. those the things that worked that you've done. Well, or the things that failed. I mean, that could be a miserable discussion <laughs> failure, but yeah. 
sort of you, as long as you've created that, and I would imagine with a clear naming convention, you could just say massive failure. Um, and as you would understand <laughs> that you saved it for that purpose, right? Or, you know, huge glowing success. And you can clearly identify that rather than. And when you share a discussion to the comments, you're sharing just the discussion topic, right? You're not sharing all of the responses from the students. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And then so here, Lauren, you have your example. You would just import this or download it to a course. Okay. Um, and then, well, by the way, that list of like who I can share it with, it was, I, mean, I kind of agree, it's probably not the most common usage. And they probably just threw it on there because there are phone and all these other possible shared link layers. You know, share it with my university, share it with the consortium, share it with, them, with the world, share it with anybody. There's like one program there. Can you share it yourself? It doesn't, share, it doesn't uh, add the student comments to the discussion, or it does? It does not. It does not. Okay. I would imagine for privacy concerns. Yeah. 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 And we can just see university uh, well, And I'm still not seeing where I can share an entire course. Yes. Uh, uh, I wanted to what that I keep teaching that to my camera. Oh. How can I do that? And find to that. It's actually just I wanna you would need to in my book. If you go to this specific URL, yeah. and then it will auto invest. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. It's a follow that book. That okay. uh, URL, and then you'll be able to no, log in. No, it's not able to. Um, right, it's not that. Yeah. Okay. Um, the reason why I wanted to sort of pivot from, or I'm going to pivot, I suppose, from Canvas Commons to another form of interdepartmental collaboration is for the purpose of lesson study. Um, is this something that anyone's familiar with? Lesson study. Um, so lesson study is a interdepartmental uh, collaborative exercise that developed out of Japan in a language learning environment, I believe, um, or it's been it's used a lot in second language acquisition. Um, and it's a collaborative effort where faculty work together um, to sort of. This is from the University of La Crosse, uh, University of Wisconsin La Crosse. Um, so forming a team of faculty, Mario, I'm thinking of your example of four or five faculty that are always teaching the same thing. Um, or a same course, if you will. Working together to develop the learning goals and sort of the objectives of the course, these may, in general, in your case, these may already be previously designed uh, or previously established, and you design a type of lesson. Collaboratively, all four people or 10 people, however many may be. An example of a French course, it was five of us working together on just one 50 minute course within a certain sequence of the course. Designing the lesson together, you're planning the study, and this is not about student learning. It's about what it is about student learning, but it's not, it's not about the instructor. It's about whether or not this type of activity, this type of lesson was effective for student learning. The way it happens is one person of your group, person perhaps the person who is scheduled as the team teacher that day is teaching the course, while everyone else on the team observes how students are interacting with the lesson itself as planned. Going from that, obviously you have your, your debrief, email, in person, et cetera, and you decide, do we repeat it to adjust it, what adjustments are needed, or can we publish this as a standardized course for the deployment, for the course sequence, um, et cetera. And then obviously document, disseminate, upload it to box to complete our circle of So this came out of lacrosse? This, the University of Wisconsin lacrosse has a massive learn, a lesson study, um, is, uh, what's the word, resource? Um, but the study itself originated in Japan in the mid 1990s. Um, and I tried to include um, at the back portion of the activity sheet, um, you have um, Mills College also has a pretty solid resource about um, lesson study as well. Um, the, from my own personal experience, I think lesson, lesson study was one of the most formative experiences that I had in my graduate experience. However, it is very time consuming uh, because you have to decide who's doing what, when are you going to collaborate, what is the lesson. Um, everyone participating in the instruction of the lesson are being present, observing, debriefing, but in the end, sort of five minds working together to create one lesson that could be standardized um, and, you know, with small iterations and edits um, over the course of um, an academic period or something like that. Um, that's an example. I don't know if this level of 
collaboration would be possible within a department. Um, and that's, I, I think maybe perhaps this is where I'm starting to step maybe on eggshells. Um, for political reasons, I don't know if just people don't want to participate or they don't have time. Um, they believe that sort of lesson design and learning maybe is just the role of the instructional designer and not the person who is delivering the course. Um, I think those conversations are really unfortunately challenging, but you know they may um, need to be had in certain instances. Um, This is just an example of um, faculty members or instructional staff working together yeah. to create a lesson or a, a course sequence yeah. in your department. So it's not necessarily, um, it's not like a, a cloud-based oh. or a storage facility. It's, this is more instructors working together to create material. Yeah. Um, or work now. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it may or may not work. It just sort of depends on how your students respond to your design decisions. I mean, your pet and the pedagogical decisions that you make um, for a particular course sequence. Um, I've had positive success with it. Um, I mean, the lesson may not have been amazing, but sort of the, the amount that you learn about teaching and about lesson design itself um, and just sort of learning from other perspectives in your own department, I think is um, foundational to that experience. Um, right, so other topics, curiosities that have come up. Um, I think at least in, in terms of the list, statewide possibility versus internal collaborations. Um, Lauren, for your example, what was the distinction you were making or the, the, the question that you had about the difference between that? This is sort of how to get around that because of access to Google or? Yeah, it was more of an access issue okay. than anything. Um, and I'm actually right now texting with the dean of the college at La Crosse because oh, nice. I'm going there next week. And, I, and she's friends with the person that's doing the lesson study project. I'm going to see if I can meet with them and get some more information on how that works because that seems like a really good way for us to do our course sharing because mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're building collaborative courses across campuses. Mm -hmm. And especially within campus, I'm thinking of the way that you could lesson study around certain types of objects from different lessons um, and sharing that um, within faculty. Uh, we talked a little bit about support roles, um, problems, um, the politics. You know, I, I don't think we, I don't know how to approach that situation. Um, Co-teaching. Mario, in your example, how is it? How do students respond to co-teaching? I think uh, I haven't heard of any, you know, no comments from a student like in evaluations or outside of class mm -hmm. uh, from TAs complaining about it. You know, what I mean, I guess sometimes that can happen, right? Because right. you, you have a person that teaches one unit, then you go to another person that teaches another unit, and of course their teaching styles are different. But the way we play out also good course, cut back. is that everything else is constant. So in other words, like we all follow the same type of template in terms of like in terms of materials we give them. So we don't add extra things, you know what I mean, to make it difficult for students to follow. So we, we try to make it as uh, friendly to the students as possible. I think the only difference is just kind of be our teaching styles in, in the class, but all the other material is consistent throughout each unit. So yeah. it's all laid out the same. And even if styles are different, I mean, I think we think this is from a student perspective or even other faculty. Maybe good for that's them. great because then you have all of those different perspectives of, I guess, approaches to course material. Um, from the, I guess, instructor perspective, is there, what's the balancing line between that? How do you decide, I'm just sort of say, I'm going to teach every Friday course and you're going to do every Monday? Or no, is it's it like units. So, like, one person teaches for three and a half weeks, another three and a half weeks, three and a half weeks. Ah, uh, okay. So there's something weeks for students, there's some consistency with physical presence. You know who it is yeah. for the first weeks. All right. Um, and this is the question that I, I, I don't know. Um, how to pitch options. Um, I think one thing in the, I guess, in the active teaching labs, it's very much a grassroots, um, non-tenured faculty members. <laughs> a lot of, I really do think that a lot of this is coming in from the bottom. Um, 
And I, one thing that I, I don't want to toot my own horn, but one thing that I really enjoyed pitching to faculty and sort of seeing it work on incrementally is press books. Um, and sort of seeing that, seeing faculty members who have been reticent in the past, adopting a press book from someone else and realizing that all they, they can edit, they can adjust it, they can make manipulations that fit their own needs and sort of seeing those slowly but surely, uh, but versus saying you must do Canvas Commons and Google, I just, I don't know if that, maybe it would work in some way, I don't know, but sort of pitching options slowly but surely. Um, and yeah. Other topics you'd like to cover in the last eight minutes? Talk about Canvas Blueprint. That is on the back side of the activity sheet. Yeah, um, worth talking about for me, a blueprint, so a Canvas Blueprint course, Cliff and Jim seem to know, the, you'll be the expert on this. Um, it is sort of a, a, a predetermined course shell that can only be altered by sort of a master course, and it branches out. So imagine you have eight sections of Calculus 1, and you want to make sure everyone has the same standardized presence, which I guess Jim Gertz is the, the, the brand of the course. But it can, no one can alter it, or you can add small bits of information, but everything is yeah. pushed out versus generated by a section it's, itself. It's perfect for the for courses where you have one syllabus that's being taught by a lot of individuals in you know, different sections, and you want to give them autonomy, and yet you maintain a little bit of control. Create a, create a blueprint that lets you be kind of the master of your own this parent version. They all get their individual versions. Ability to set up how much autonomy they have. So maybe certain pages you don't want them to be able to touch. Mm -hmm. This is they can't alter, but you can release to them powers to create their own custom pages and their own custom content. So, so they wouldn't be able to alter like when when a quiz is due, the questions of a quiz, if you, if you the weight okay, of a yeah. okay. correct. Correct. I mean, you could allow things that are not linked to the blueprint. Uh -huh. So I mean, it is as much or as little, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, it's, it's tricky too because we've used it probably inappropriately sometimes when really we should have just had a, a sandbox course and then copied that to the live course. Yeah. But really it's for a scenario where you have one master course and then these small variations of that yeah. course. Mm -hmm. And the, the big advantage is A, the control that Cliff described, but also B, you can push changes. Yeah. All, those, all the parts of those little subsidiary courses that are linked back to uh, the immediately. you can hit a switch and kind of push those updates to that course. So say they all have the same quizzes, right? Yeah. But different instructor pages or something. Sure. You can update the quizzes all at once. So in that very specific scenario, that's, that's one of, yeah, that's very yeah, handy. Uh, there, yeah, there's some warnings and caveats with that is that it is not always obvious to the people in the subsidiary and that if they go in and edit some of the things that are connected to the blueprint, that breaks that connection. So it really is a place where you as a team need to be kind of disciplined about, you know, who edits what. So for example, the TA could break the connection to the blueprint course by editing the If quiz. they have the power to edit sure. those, those pages. Uh, and I understand. Like I said, you can lock people out of those things, but there uh, may be a case where you want someone to kind of be able to muck with stuff along the way. So you need to have a very precise conversation about yep. it. But as long as people are aware of that, yeah, it, it really alleviates a lot of the, the labor Something I think, but you can request a blueprint course, right? I'm always requesting one from you, but I don't know if that's um, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, through the Larry UW support yeah. line, yeah, request us to create yeah. blueprints. But if you just have one, stuff. like one course, and you're all working in it, and then you just are going to have a new one each semester, it's better to just probably have a copy, mm -hmm. and, yeah. yeah, and import each time. So yeah. a blueprint is more than you need, but it's a nice tool. Anything else? No? Well, sorry for this shortened session by five minutes, but uh, <laughs> grab, a, <laughs> grab a bagel, extra coffee on your way out. Um, if you could, uh, fill up the evaluation sheet that you have in front of you, either on purple or yellow, uh, depending on what side of your room you're on. Um, and next week, we are back with um, Pressbooks and Engage eTexts on Thursday, and then following that, I believe, 
um, is Top Hat, and John Martin is currently at the Top Hat conference, and he is going to share all of his new wisdom um, about Top Hat in your course, and I will be off the hook for that. Um, so thanks again for coming. Enjoy the sun, and we will see you next week. You guys get much advance notice on it because sometimes I come to the rooms completely full. So no, it's it's all down to the subject. You think? Or it's all down to the day. The day. Mm -hmm. What other people are going on? Well, thank you. I appreciate it. They, they didn't want to collaborate with us today. <laughs> <laughs> the tool. Yeah.